take it away. My good friend, Bernard Guth, everybody. Give it up. Uh, hello, everyone. First of all, thank you, Benny, once again, for another amazing regeneration event. Uh, I'm not sure who anybody is aware of my work. Has any come, ever come across my work? Veilofreality.com. Lots of information on there, essays, videos, films. I made three films also with my good friend, Umberto, seven years ago. They're on there as well. Um, this talk is actually a little bit based on the talk I gave last year at the Regeneration event. Last year, the title was The Path Towards Awakening in the Matrix Control System. It's available at my website. There's a video there on YouTube. So this talk, I want to go into more specifics about the term of awakening, what it actually means, and also look into some of the traps on the path towards awakening. And obviously the slides will be very hard to read, so I have some quotes, I will read them any, anyway from the screen. So, obviously we're in pretty in, intense times in this day and age, and on some level we see more and more people are experiencing an awakening, right? We see it in ourselves, and you guys consider yourselves awake to a certain degree. But I've also seen that this word awake, to be awake, has been it's very loosely used these days. It's a bit abused, right? Because when you say you're awake, or I'm awake, we're not truly, truly awake from the deepest esoteric meaning of the word in terms of union with the divine, right? There are different levels of stages of awakening, right? We can be awake on the basic level when we see through the lies of the governments, 9-11 and all of that, and many people already claim that they have taken the red pill and say, oh, I'm awake. But again, from an esoteric perspective, it hardly can be called having taken the red pill. So when we talk about awakening, we also basically talk about the evolution of consciousness. And that's really what it's all about, about soul evolution. And that awakening process, which we really need to keep in mind, is a highly individual process, unique for each of one and very different for, for each of us, right? Now, with regards to the evolution of consciousness, let's look into the etymology or the definition of what it actually means to be conscious and what the word consciousness means. The word consciousness refers to an individual sense of recognition of something within or without oneself. It comes from the Latin word conscious, knowing aware, to be awake or awakened to an inner realization of a truth. It also relates to conscience. The word conscience, etymologically speaking, means to know together. It's derived from the Latin prefix con, together, and the Latin verb sierra, to know and to understand. Therefore, development of the evolution of consciousness Consciousness means knowing more together, seeing things differently than previously known. Hence, the evolution of consciousness implies working or progressing towards a higher state of awareness, a higher state of being. It implies to see the world and oneself more and more objectively, to see the universe as it sees itself. Enlightenment is basically a state when the observer and the observed have become one and there's no separation but complete unity, uh, union, with the divine, which is the literal meaning of yoga. So with regards to objectivity, obviously in our state of being and, uh, and consciousness we're in right now, we cannot fully perceive the world objectively. And uh, even ourselves, we cannot see ourselves completely objectively. We all have our subjective blind spots, right? But we're working towards a higher level of objectivity through the process of awakening. But it does require conscious efforts. So when we talk about the process of awakening and conscious evolution, we need to make conscious efforts. And this work or this path is two-folded. It is, implies seeking truth within and without. And what this really means is that we need to both work on our inner being to really dislodge our programs, our conditioning, social, cultural, including our wounds, our traumas, and all of that, to clear that out to connect more to our true self, our embodied soul, our unique soul purpose, right? So that's the inner esoteric work and also implies basic psychological work. On the other hand, but it also implies to seek truth, quote unquote, out there in terms of learning how to use your mind, basic critical thinking, being able to discern truth from lies, reading, study. It has its place, although it's limited. The mind is in itself limited, even logic is limited, but it goes together, right? Um, I see a lot of people most often actually fall into one of these two camps, so to speak. A lot of people are very much 
only working, you know, doing the inner work, and it can sometimes become a very self-indulgent, narcissistic process of just focusing on yourself, my wounds, you know, and always trying to actually escape the world to go meditate in a cave somewhere and finding that enlightenment, right? And you see this especially here in California, a lot of people are into yoga and self-development, self-improvement and all of that, but they don't really have any understanding of the matrix of the truth and lies out there, and they still believe in government and vote for Obama or Hillary or whatever, right? Now, on the other side of the coin, I see a lot of people also in the quote-unquote conspiracy truth movement or anarchist movement. They are very much knowledgeable about the matrix out there and the lies we're being told, the pathologies and all of that, but they are not really engaged in any inner work, right? And uh, <clears throat> hence, actually, shadow project based on young psychology, their own issues onto the world and become very angry in all of that, and they're not aware of it, right? Or as, as Umberto in his short, brilliant talk mentioned before, a lot of people can be very ex excellent intellectual scholars about how the world and the matrix works, but they have the emotional intelligence of a five-year-old. Hence, you know, we need to work on our inner being as well, so the, the work of, of awakening is an inner and outer process. As a... Uh, the Russian mystic Gurdjieff said, in right knowledge, the study of man must proceed on parallel lines with the study of the world, and the study of the world must run parallel with the study of man. Now, there is the so-called esoteric triad of knowledge being understanding, which is very important to understand because, as I mentioned before, in the de definition of consciousness, of knowing more together, Knowledge, in that sense, is not merely intellectual information, right? Knowledge, actually, from an esoteric spiritual perspective, ties into gnosis, embodied knowledge, to live that knowledge. So a lot of mis people mistake knowledge with just intellectual information. They read, get information from YouTube and all of that, but it is not embodied because being is missing. And being is really a level of being relates to also uh, embodiment, your soul individualization, right? to find that center within you, that connection to source, and clear everything that is in, in the way, basically, of anchoring the higher frequencies, and then you come to a true understanding, which is wisdom, to live that knowledge, right? So intellectual you know, uh, <clears throat> pursuit of knowledge and disinformation is a dead-end road, because it needs to be matched up with being in order to understand. You know, many of us, <clears throat> when we read books, you, even a spiritual literature, it resonates with you on a deep level, right? Because you sense the truth. But I'm sure you guys can relate to it. You only, many things you understand intellectually, but you never really experience it on a deeper level. So it is about this inner esoteric work, which also implies basic psychological work to raise level of being, so we can access also higher levels of knowledge, essentially gnosis, which goes beyond the mind and the intellect. Now, ultimately, the goal or like the aim of, of the true awakened state is to become a crunch, conscious transducer of divine will. And what does it mean, divine will? Well, it's tricky territory. We're going to talk about divine and God, you know. Many people have an aversion to it because we have been conditioned with the whole dogma of religions and this guy in the sky who judges us, right? But this is not what the true divine is about. The divine permeates everything. It's deep within us, our seed our, that connects us to our soul purpose, right? To our own individual soul talents and soul lessons, which we need to align with and hence to something higher that goes beyond even our egoic will or the personality we think we are. Because ultimately we all have our, our purpose and again the mind cannot grasp it. But the higher you go, you, or you deeper you delve into yourself and work sincerely on yourself, you actually will be confronted with the illusion of control and how much, how less, how actually no control you actually have with, with who you identify yourself with, right? Um, <clears throat> as Sri Aurobindo from Integral Yoga stated, the state of ignorance in which you believe that you are the doer of your acts persists as long as it is necessary for your development but as soon as you are capable of passing into higher condition, you begin to see that you're an instrument of the one consciousness. You take a step upward and you rise to a higher level conscious, to a higher conscious level. Right? And we all have these moments sometimes when you're in the zone, right? We all kind of actually channels of how our divine knowledge, if we can get ourselves out of the way, right? Get even the mind out of the way. But again, it was... Um, 
it's, it's dependent on our level of being and embodiment, how much of this divine will we can access or align ourselves with. And like on that note, a good hint of what your own sole purpose is in that sense is what Joseph Campbell referred to following your bliss. Like something that excites you, something that you're really passionate about without any expectations, without caring what other people th think, without any ambition even, and without any expectation of return or reward, right? So that's, that's really what, it goes beyond any ego desire really. Now, Adya Shanti uh, summarizes this really well here, what I'm talking about. All of us, in our own process of awakening, will visit the limitation of our personal will. Most of us will visit it uh, several different times on deeper and deeper levels until it's fully extinguished. The loss of personal will isn't really a loss at all. It's not as if we become the doormat of humanity that we stop knowing what to do or how to do it. Quite the opposite happens. By surrendering the illusion of personal will, a whole different state of consciousness is born and a rebirth happens. It's almost like a resurrection happens from deep within us. This resurrection is very hard to explain, like many things in spirituality, but in essence, we start to be moved by the completeness and totality of life itself. When you get out of the driver's seat, you find that life can drive itself, that actually life has always been driving itself life becomes almost magical. The illusion of the me is no longer in the way. Life begins to flow, and you never know where it will take you. There's a new way of operating, and it's not really about making this decision or that decision, the right decision or the wrong decision. It is more like navigating a flow. You feel where events are moving, and you feel for the right thing to do. It's like a river that knows which way to turn around a rock, to the left or to the right. It's an intuitive, innate sense of knowing. This kind of flow is always available to us, but most of us are too lost in the complexities of our thinking to feel that there's a simple and natural flow to life. But underneath the turmoil of thought and emotion, and underneath the grasping of the personal will, there's indeed a flow, there's a simple movement of life. This is truly available to all of us and we have forgotten it. It also relates to being in flow of the Tao, right? The Chinese be like water, but we have been you know, con so conditioned our society where pathology has become normalized. You know, we grow up in a society that's completely removed from nature and spirit. When we, in our educational system, the uh, intellect is worship, IQ, you know, information, memory, and grading. We're nothing being taught about emotional intelligence or intuition. So <clears throat> we're starting, you know, that's, that's almost the modus operandi of the matrix to disconnect us from our own inner guidance system, from our own divine source. And hence, we also increase the body-mind split, right? We are out of touch with our bodies, we get in our heads, and the more we disembody it, disconnect it from source, the more we look outside for guidance. And that's really the original rise of authoritarianism, to tell, find somebody else to tell us what to do, a leader to follow. Now, <clears throat> again, this, this path towards awakening in, in, includes deep inner work, right? Also confronting emotions, feelings we have suppressed and ran away of for our whole life and even lifetimes, right? And we easily buff up and push things away. And especially in our society, there's a stigma around vulnerability to, you know, always when people say, how are you doing? And, you know, you automatically reply with, I'm fine. You know, actually on that little note, when I first came to the U.S. from Germany in 94, I was just starting to learn English, and people were greeting me in Hollywood and like, how are you doing, how are you doing? And I'm like, oh, this person's so interested in how I'm feeling. <laughs> and I'm like unloading my life and what <laughs> how much issues, I'm completely confusing the person until I realized you guys just say, I'm fine. Or you reply with the same question, how are you, how are you? Okay, right, so. But it says a lot about you know, how we operate, and we all have our social masks, right? But we all are wounded. We all suffer on some level, right? So vulnerab showing vulnerability is actually true strength, right? On an emotional level. So, but this whole process of awakening is a whole topic on its own, which I talked about more in my last uh, presentation at Regeneration, you guys can check out. But what I want to touch upon more are the traps on the path towards awakening. And there are many different traps. I want to just touch upon the main ones, which I see in others and in myself, and I've fallen into all of them. 
and still sometimes do, right? Because the, the path is not the straight line. We go back and forth, we fail, try and error. It's normal, right? We figure out things out as we go along. Now, the biggest one is spiritual bypassing. I'm, not sure, I'm sure some of you have heard of this uh, term. And spiritual bypassing is a term coined by John Wellwood in 1984. It's the use of spiritual practices and beliefs to avoid dealing with our painful feelings and unresolved wounds and development, developmental needs. We engage in spiritual bypassing when we bypass necessary basic psychological work, believing ourselves to be more self-aware than we actually are and thus overestimate our state of being. Basically, the whole New Age movement can be uh, summarized by spiritual bypassing. So here's some aspect of, of spiritual bypassing I, I see a lot and I've seen myself as well. So as mentioned, using spiritual practice to actually escape unpleasant emotions, for example, using meditation to dissociate from emotion rather than feeling them and transmute them. Now I see this a lot, like for me, when I, meditation is very, very important, right? Special, especially in this day and age. But there's a, we can meditate wrongly, so to speak, when you sit with your eyes closed, and the whole point is to stay in the present moment and feel what's coming up, feel your body, get in your body sensitivity, and even anything that doesn't feel right to feel deeper into that. And love what arises, let it come up, and then sometimes sadness, grief, or whatever comes up, and then you need to feel it, and sometimes you may cry. That's the whole point. But a lot of people then actually dissociate, they go up in the head, right? Or you start daydreaming when you identify with a thought and you're somewhere else. You're not meditating anymore. Your body may be still, but you're not meditating. So that's an example of how to uh, <coughs> use spiritual bypass in, in, in light of um, spiritual bypassing. The next one, exaggerated detachment, emotional numbing and repression, which kind of relates to what I just said, but it, it ties into the body-mind split when we escape into the head and have lost our body sensitivity, right? Or, you know, have built so much armor that we don't even feel anymore. Right? And it's also natural, like living in this world we live, we naturally become desynthesized because of the craziness, literally. Right? But the way back is through the body to feel, to feel our emotions and without judgment, really. Overemphasis on the positive, that's a big one in the new age, the distortion of the law of attraction and the distortion of how you create your own reality and all of that, which is a whole topic on its own with the lie of solipsism. Um, but, you know, nothing against positivity. We need to empower ourselves and be positive, right? And also not listen to our inner critic and the negative thoughts we tell ourselves. But, you know, we need to look at the world as it is. It's about making the darkness conscious, right? As Carl Jung said, um, one doesn't become enlightened by imagining figures of light, but by making the darkness conscious. Otherwise, the, you know, if you avoid it, it, it just gets buried in the unconscious and it will have to come out on some, on, on some level. And most often come, it comes actually out as, then, as disease or illness if it's not processed on an emotional or psychological level. Anger phobia, that's a big one. And the anger phobia most often results in passive aggressiveness and a make nice mask or a people pleaser mask. And uh, anger phobia is also relates to actually fear of conflict. I see a lot of people have actually fear of conflict. They're afraid of how other people may react to them, right? Or experience these negative emotions. And anger, you know, has a bad rap in spirituality, right? When in its purest form, anger is actually incredible, creative, productive energy, which we can use for change or to empower ourselves. And anger is also a very appropriate response to make your boundary clear, to say no when your space has been evaded, to stand up for injustice and all of that. Anger becomes toxic if we project it onto another person and we hate on them, we want to punish them, we want to kill them. That's when it's toxic. But anger in its purest form is, uh, <coughs> is powerful creative energy that helps us to stand up for ourselves and for others. Blind or overly tolerant compassion and weak boundaries, which ties kind of to anger phobia. And obviously compassion, empathy is very important, right? We need to be compassionate to others and especially with ourselves. But, you know, again, the new age and pop spiritually has this, has this whole thing confused. Also ties into the confusion with we are all one, right? Yes, we are one, but we are not all the same. There are seven billion people on this planet with vast different levels of consciousness. They're genetic psychopaths. They're born without a conscience who can never access compassion, empathy, love in this lifetime at all. And they just 
produce havoc, right? They hide behind the mask of sanity and can em emulate all these emotions. From an esoteric perspective, they're organic portals, soulless humans as well, which is a whole topic on its own. But what I'm saying is, you know, when <clears throat> we get abused, we need to make our boundaries clear. We cannot just put it up and just be compassionate with a predator, so to speak, right? It's not about attacking him, it's not about punishing him and all that, but again, making your boundaries clear. It's about the healthy male aspect of consciousness to be a warrior in this day and age as well and hold your ground and say no. Forceful efforts to kill or eradicate the ego or judging it as bad. That's a big one in a lot of um, Eastern religion practices that the ego is bad and you need to kill the ego or it ties into dogmatic Catholic Christian teachings that the body is sin, the flesh is sin and all of that or the, the whole physical world uh, we need to escape and it's, it's, it's the devil and all of that. Um, <clears throat> well, it's kind of it's a paradox because essentially we need to transcend the ego and the personality, but it's not about too much about killing it, but making it a transducer, a vessel for the divine force, for divine will to work through, because we still need the ego to exist in this 3D reality, right? And then especially also, people have been extremely traumatized and wounded. Like we all have to varying degrees and we grow up with very low self-esteem, like for me, for example, extreme low self-esteem, very wounded, dealing with guilt and shame, and very high levels of insecurity. So I actually also had to build a healthy ego first before I can, can engage into deeper spiritual work, right? Using statements, absolute higher truths such as everything is perfect, it's all an illusion, we are one, love is all there is as philosophical or intellectual concepts to avoid dealing with the not so pleasant aspects of reality uh, in everyday life in this 3D duality, basically bypassing responsibility and lessons of our 3D incarnation. So as it says, these statements, everything is perfect, all there is love, all this illusion, um, <clears throat> are true from this higher perspective, from much higher, but we are, we are on this lower 3D reality, right? And most often people use these concepts, these sayings on an intellectual level without having truly experienced that, right? And as I mentioned, for example, we are one. Yes, everything is one, but we are not equal. There are vast different levels of consciousness. This is a big topic I just wanted to mention uh, here. It's about abusing medicine plants. You know, it's, I recently wrote an article about it, the medicine plant entrapment, uh, and I've worked for 20 years with psychedelics, medicine plants, mushrooms, ayahuasca, wachuma, and they are amazing tools, right? They can help us in many different ways to heal and, and become aware, but I've seen how more and more people abuse these medicines, especially this day and age, especially ayahuasca. And I'm, I'm, in my private practice, I do holistic counseling and I'm in body work and what, and I've worked with a few individuals who have taken on demonic entity possessions from ayahuasca ceremonies gone wrong. So there are dangers to that, and a lot of people can also get hooked to this peak experience, you know, the DMT rush in your brain that happens and go to ceremony after ceremony, 80, 90 ceremonies, and it's actually det detrimental, right? They're kind of experienced like a false sense of awakening because they are addicted to that emotional rush. But again, that's just a topic on its own. So I just wanted to mention a few of these basic or most common um, symptoms of or points of uh, spiritual bypassing. Now this <coughs> trap, trap of superiority. I don't know if you can read this. Whoa, well, the individual does not, the individual ego does not exist. I'm so freaking enlightened. <laughs> <laughs> that's a big one. So the trap of superiority it's almost a natural byproduct or, or byproduct of the awakening process. Because we all, when we wake up, right, um, and find truths and, uh, you know, and see through the lies and all of that, and how people actually sleepwalk, dreaming to be awake. You know, naturally we then can look down on people, right? We can call them sheeple in all of that. But that's in itself a matrix program. The moment you see yourself better at somebody else, the matrix has you. But also when you see yourself lower, right? I mean, the moment you put somebody on a pedestal, you're disempowering yourself. So it's really, we need to watch out, you know, because essentially, also we all are in our own process of awakening and our own process is very different than other people's process. Sometimes we project what works for us onto other people. We don't, who are we to judge another person so lesson when we hardly know our own, right? That's our own process. So that's, you know, but that's, 
as I said, I think it's almost a natural byproduct of the awakening process, so to speak. Another big trap is the trap of forcefully trying to wake up others. And I've fallen into this one big time, <laughs> many times. Um, it's always naturally, because when we wake up and see the lies and how we've been lied to, but on a basic level, be it government, corruption, and you know, the lies of history and all of this, and we see how our friends and family still believe in these lies and suffer needlessly, we want to shake them awake, right? But if you have tried it forcefully, send them information, I'm sure you see the repercussion with cognitive dissonance and the, the arguments and the fights, right? Especially family members. I mean, there's a saying, as Ram Dass said, if you want to check your level of enlightenment, spend a week with your family, right? And see the, deal with those triggers. But <clears throat> we, we cannot uh, wake up others forcefully, even if it comes from a well-intending place, right? Look at your own path. Nobody woke you up forcefully, you know, pushed information on you, made you wake up, which is a complete paradox anyway. Um, <clears throat> because it also ties into the esoteric concept on understanding of the law of free will, right? You cannot give when it's not asked for. We need to respect, you know, almost somebody's free will to stay ignorant. And there are two concepts to really understand, which are external consideration and strategic, strategic enclosure. External considera consideration means adapting to the worldview and beliefs of another person and thus not pushing information onto someone who didn't ask for it in the first place. Sometimes this approach involves supporting other people's illusions because they are not ready to hear the truth, let alone be assisted in becoming unplugged from the matrix control system. In esoteric terms, giving without sincere asking is a violation of free will. It may interfere with the soul lesson, the path of the other person involved, an individual who needs to learn certain lessons for him or herself, even if that entails long periods of suffering and struggle. And that's hard to, you know, sometimes accept, but that's, again, it, it ties into what is really the other person's soul lessons, and everybody needs to awaken in their own terms, in their own way. You know, you know what the biggest trigger for awakening is? Suffering. That's actually the true meaning or the true place in our, from an esoteric spiritual perspective of why they're suffering. You know, my own life, again, having dealt with extreme depression, despair in my 20s, suicidal thoughts, and not fitting in, not understanding what this world is about, you know, I was suffering deeply, and that drove me to ask the question, who am I, what's going on in the world, right? So that's, sometimes we ask, even in this world, people are suffering and they don't even know that they are suffering. Right? And sometimes it's like, how much harder or worse does it have to get until it initiates that awakening, that impulse to seek truth and question the world. Strategic enclosure relates to having a strategy with regards to how to present information that may challenge another's belief system. Sometimes it is more productive to remain silent than to drop knowledge bombs on an unsuspecting mind, let alone trying to convince the other person through arguments and debate which only creates the emotional loose frequency for occult forces to feed upon. <clears throat> That's another topic I'll go into a bit later. This also ties into the saying, do not give what is holy to the dogs, nor cast your pearls before swine, lest they trample under their feet and turn and tear you in pieces, such as the biblical de uh, description of cognitive dissonance, in the most basic terms. At other times, however, directness in calling a spade a spade is needed in an appropriate response as well. So these two concepts, external consideration and strategic enclosure, depend on each situation and context, right? It's different. Uh, but the more you actually work in yourself, increase your level of being and sensitivity, the more you know yourself, the better you can read other people and intuitively know what to say and what not to say, so it's not coming from your own shadow projection or ego ambition and whatnot. Right? And some, actually from an esoteric perspective, white lies are acceptable, right? In order to protect your path and also not like uh, unnecessarily attract the matrix or opposition towards you. So it's, it's a thin line. On the other side of the coin, I've seen some people who have used external consideration as an avoidance to actually speak up because of their anger, phobia, or fear of conflict, right? So sometimes we need to give the lie what it deserves, the truth, and be direct and call a spade a spade. But again, each situation and context is different. And you know, with strategy, it's also about uh, you know, what it really comes down to is the best way we can help others and assist is via what I call spreading seeds of awareness. You know, 
be it that that's the best way to use social medias, whatever you post, right? And then people will gravitate to you, people will attack you properly for it. So um, <clears throat> that's a good training ground almost to know how to communicate in a sense and without triggers. Or in personal interactions, when you talk with somebody, you can sense maybe like, you know, say something, you know, about a certain topic and see how this person reacts. And then you could go maybe a bit deeper, right? But it, they're asking what the person needs to be sincere. And sincerity is a whole topic on its own. You know, ex Gurdjieff actually said sincerity with everyone is a weakness, which is also like, well, what do you mean? We, we need to be honest. Like, no, we, you know, there are various forces acting through people and, you know, especially that may attack or will uh, target you once you start to wake up. So we need to be very discerning what, how we share and what we share, so to speak. But in terms of sincerity, it's most important that we are sincere with ourselves and how honest we are with ourselves. The trap of wanting to help others, which relates to the previous tab, and that sounds very counterintuitive, <laughs> because of course we're supposed to help others, right? We need to help others, and we need to be there for each other. But again, you know, I work, I've been working now as a, as a body work holistic coach for over 10 years, doing deep processing with people on one-on-one -on -one level, and I'm sure as you guys know, you cannot help anyone who's not willing to help themselves. And that's really what it comes down to. It actually ties into the true meaning of love, as Gurdjieff um, wrote so brilliantly, it would be necessary to develop oneself to such an extent that it would be possible to know and understand enough to be able to aid someone else in doing something necessary for himself, even when that person was not conscious of the need and might work against you. That only in this sense was love properly responsible and worth of the name of real love. Even with the best of intentions, most people would be too afraid to love, love another person in active sense or even to attempt to do anything for them. And that one of the terrifying aspects of love was that while it was possible to help another person to a certain degree, it was not possible to actually do anything for them. If you see another man fall down when he must walk, you can pick him up. But although to take one more step is more necessary for him than even air, he must take this step alone. Impossible for another person to take it for him. And that's really what it comes down to. Again, also ties into the law of free will, right? To not interfere with another person's lesson. Even we know they make bad decisions, but we, they need to learn through their own experience. And you know, this, the trap of wanting to help others and forcefully trying to wake, wake up others is especially hard in relationships. Right, let's say romantic relationships when one partner is waking up and the other person not, and the more waking part is trying to like get the other person on the same page, and it's it's not a good, uh, has, doesn't have a good effect, right? And then the whole wishful thinking and all of that, and then just drama ensues. So and then on you know on a whole different that's a topic on its own, but relationship also take on a whole new level for anybody who's engaged in this process of awakening. That's a big one too, the trap trap of victim and blame consciousness. Now that's also a natural byproduct first to fall into victim blame in the awakening process, especially as we become aware of what Gurdjieff called the horror of the situation. <laughs> <laughs> and we see the pathology, you know, not only in the outward world how we've been lied to, but also when we engage in deeper, sincere inner work, how mechanical we are, how easily we, well, how we have lied to ourselves, our own issues and avoidance and all of that, and our mechanical nature. And the more you see your own mechanical nature, you see it then more in others, right? So that's what he referred to as the horror of the situation. But then, you know, we confronted the government, the psychopaths, right, who have done all these terrible things to us and to humanity, killing, engaging genocide, wars, and all this. So naturally, you want to blame them, fuck them, right, take them down. But that's also just a stage. I call that, I wasn't that stage, definitely. I call this my romantic or revolutionary phase, you know, listening to a lot of Rage Against the Machine and all of that and getting my anger out. And it's an important phase. But ultimately, as you gauge deeper, especially in this inner work, you realize... It's all about complete self-responsibility. You cannot blame anyone or anything, anyone for anything anymore. And nor can you blame your parents, unfortunately, right? They also wounded and blame. So we have to, we are on our own, so to speak. So, but it's so embedded in the collective psyche, this, this victim consciousness. So in a nutshell, regardless what happened to us, in the light of the process of awakening, we need to become aware of the victim archetype that is strongly embedded in our collective psyche 
in order to empower ourselves and take self-responsibility for our healing, growth, and life journey. Because the victim blame consciousness is a very low frequency disempowered state in its essence. Right? And also to understand that in light of soul evolution, the evolution of consciousness, all these are lessons. From a higher perspective, from the divine perspective, soul perspective, there is no such thing as good or bad experiences. There's just experience. Because ultimately, we are already eternal. We just have forgotten that. And we experience consequent lifetimes to our, for our own, own cell evolution and soul path, which is very unique to each of us, right? But in the end, when you understand that all these are lessons, there's something to learn from everything. And everything is actually, life is the biggest teacher. It teaches you, it shows you exactly what you need to learn to evolve to a higher level and come more and more into union with the divine. A big one to this uh, blame consciousness is about self-importance. And this is a great quote from uh, Car Carlos Castaneda's The Fire From Within, Don Juan here. Self-importance is our greatest enemy. Think about it. What weakens us is feeling offended by the deeds and misdeeds of our fellow men. Our self-importance requires that we spend most of our lives offended by someone. Every effort should be made to eradicate self-importance from the lives of warriors. Without self-importance, we are invulnerable. Self-importance is not something simple and naive. On the one hand, it is the core of everything that is good in us, and on the other hand, the core of everything that is rotten. To get rid of self-importance is... Uh, to get rid of self-importance that is rotten requires a masterpiece of strategy. Warriors fight self-importance as a matter of strategy, not principle. Impeccability is nothing else but the proper use of energy. My statements have no linking to morality. I've saved energy, and that makes me impeccable. <laughs> Thank you. To understand, <laughs> to understand this, you have to save energy yourself. In the strategic... In the strategic inventories of warriors, self-importance figures as the activity that consumes the greatest amount of energy, hence the effort to eradicate it. What does it mean in a nutshell? Don't take yourself so fucking serious. Right? We need to like, understand also not to get identified with our roles. Remember, like, even when we're not aware, of, we, are con we are transducers of higher energies. Right? And we're just playing a role here. And the more we identify ourselves with it, the more we fall into the trap of identification, which I go a bit deeper later on. But then we fall into the trap of self-importance, the ego, right? And then we get easily offended. And you see what happens nowadays, right? With identity politics and the far left and all of that, you know, trying to install laws so no one gets offended anymore, right? It's, it's, it's pathological, actually, all of that. Or you see it in social media, right? It's also learning to never take anything personal because it is never personal. Right? Because what, what, what gets offended within you is just the, your, what you, your personality you think you are. It's not your real self. The trap of savior martyr consciousness, which also ties into the blame victim consciousness. The savior consciousness is when we be become a missionary. We want to save the world, right? And all of that, and the self importance comes with it, and feeling the ego feeds off of that. Or the martyr consciousness, which is a big one. I see this a lot, especially in activists out there in the truth movement who put themselves into very compromising situations and get arrested just to prove a point, right? And, you know, it kind of feeds the martyr complex. Or, you know, you feed off, like, you know, how you're being attacked and all of that without taking self-responsibility, how you could have actually protected yourself and if you would have actually worked on yourself more and have been more strategic about it with external consideration, you wouldn't have gotten yourself into this situation, right? So the save and martyr consciousness is also what the matrix, you know, uh, is installed on us, especially with the, we see the savior program in religion, we see the savior program in uh, the new age with aliens supposed to save us at some point. So, all of that ties into the drama triangle, the dreaded drama triangle. Maybe some of you heard of it. And that's the persecutor, rescuer, and victim. And as long as you're deeply unconscious, we fall into one of these roles. Right? The persecutor is the one who tears down, who wants to punish others and hate on others. And, you know, it's, the, it's fueled by, by rage, really. The rescuer... The rescue is also what I call the white knight syndrome, when we like 
want to save other people, but it comes also from a place of, of, of fear of not being needed, or there's a power play behind it, right? Um, and the victim, obviously the victim archetype, <clears throat> feels powerless and is completely stuck in self-pity and poor me, and obviously the rescuer and the victim make a perfect match. I mean, that a lot of relationships are based on that victim-savior archetype, actually. I fell into that. <laughs> Hi. Um, so, but there's, an, you know, when, again, this is like, we, we can see it collectively, as well as in individual lives, how these archetypes play out, right? Now, the empowered triangle, so to speak, out of the victim becomes, uh, uh, the creator rises. I mean, I can do it, it's self-empowered, I can help myself. The persecutor becomes the challenger. Like many of us, we are challengers, right? We need to challenge the status quo, speak truth, also criticize and all of that and expose, but not without the shadow projective hate and anger and just trying to punish somebody, right? And out of the rescue, then the coach, the somebody who is able to hold space, who, can, who is helping others to help themselves, so to speak, instead of trying to help do the work for them or saving them. Nobody needs to be saved anyway, by the way, and nor the world needs saving. The next trap, <clears throat> that's a big one, I mentioned in my last talk as well, it's a trap of the revolutionary mind, or stuck in 3D. And that goes deep into the whole Metis control system, which goes way beyond than what we see on the 3D level. It goes way beyond government, banking, medicine, you know, pharmaceuticals. It goes way beyond chemtrails, goes way beyond Zionist Illuminati and all of that. But it relates to what I call the hyperdimensional matrix control system, right? With unseen forces that have been really ruling over this planet humanity for thousands and thousands of years and have even genetically modified us from our original uh, genetic blueprint. And even all the, the psychopaths out there, you know, who create the wars, who inflict suffering on other, on, 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 on masses of people throughout the ages, they are merely puppets for these forces themselves. In fact, the most of them are, are uh, <coughs> vessels for these demonic entities to incarnate. As Sri Aurobindo wrote in The Hidden Forces of Life from his Integral Yoga teaching, the eye of the yogin sees not only the outward events and persons and causes, but the enormous forces which precipitate them into action. If the man who fought were instruments in the hands of rulers and financiers, these in turn were mere puppets in the clutch of those hidden hyperdimensional forces. When one is habituated to see things behind, one is no longer prone to be touched by the outward aspects or to expect any remedy from political, institutional, or social changes. The only way out is through the descent of an embodied consciousness which is not the puppet of these forces, but is greater than they are. And that ties into the esoteric work of, of the process of awakening of soul embodiment, raising your frequency in terms, not in a new age way, but in, in light of anchoring the divine force. And that has way more powerful on external reality than trying to change it through any legislation or uh, <coughs> activism in the sense. I'm not saying to refrain from action, right? I'm not saying to just you know, meditate in a navel and then everything will change. Miraculously, it's about coming in line with your true soul purpose, what you're truly here to do, to come from being, and then the right action arises. And then so Lisa Renee also nails it here in this quote. In the big picture, it really does not matter what person is the president, what organization is spraying chemtrails, running the cabals, or financing negative alien blackout projects. They are symbols of a collective mind control puppet playing out the role as the unseen forces or force manipulates the ego's behavior to keep the same 3D structure feeding the same vampires. They will just pluck another dominating ego persona from the masses to play out the same fear manipulation program. And here she uh, mentions the whole agenda of the hyperdimensional matrix control system, which is humanity is not on top of the food chain. Right? They feed off a certain frequency, the frequency of fear, of suffering, uh, of wars, of doubt, of depression, of all these lower states. You know, the whole matrix is based on this egoic fear, uh, survival-based frequency, and this is what they try to keep us in and feed off of. And as you mentioned, right, it, it really doesn't matter who is president at all. You know, Trump, Hillary, whatever. We all know, I'm sure most of us, that the government is, is, is an iconic program in itself. Right, but what they're after is just this emotional luge. And actually, for with Trump now in in, in for, as an example in power, 
and all the leftist progressive people getting riled up and literally projecting their shadow on them and the hate, they create exactly the luge these forces want. But I, essentially, they don't care who is in power. They just want that friction, right? It's, it's about divide and conquer. Now, here's a graphic you cannot see. <laughs> I used last time uh, just a... Uh, in my last talk, and you can find it on, in the video, about the basics of, of, of how I <clears throat> um, see the matrix, so to speak. On the 3D level, the tree, on the, on the, on the scene levels, on the, the physical matrix of government, corporations, military, media, and all of that, including on a deeper 3D level, shadow government, geoengineering, secret space program, mind control, all of that. But on the root level, below, unseen, it's the hyperdimensional matrix, and that feeds everything else, and it's behind everything else, so called hidden forces, right? And that's, you know, as long as we only focus on the 3D level, we are we are distracted by the shadows on the wall like Plato's allegory of the cave. No change will happen through that. And it's also, if you're sincere in your spiritual inner work, esoteric work, you start to develop what uh, Shri Aurobindo called yogic consciousness, and you start to actually perceive these forces directly. It's actually a byproduct of, of the awakening process. And perceiving them directly doesn't necessarily mean that you see them visually. Some do, who are clairvoyant, but it's a higher cognitive sixth sense recognition beyond the mind. Right? And you start to see actually how these forces work through people, right? or through your own minds trying to interfere, give you thought injections to try to derail you in all of that. But again, this, this hyperdimensional matrix topic is a huge topic, and there's way more information on my website, veilofreality.com, with lots of resources you guys can check out yourself. The next trap, the trap of fighting evil. Again, sounds counterintuitive, right? We need to fight evil. <laughs> Right? And I'm not saying not to stand up for what we need to stand up for, but we need to understand what is evil. Right? We live in duality. There's dark, there's light. As long as you try to get on this level, try to get rid of the other side, it's not going to happen on this level. It is, you know, from a... You see, it like from that perspective, from a higher level, the divine, everything comes from the one, right? Everything is manifested from the one, and as we enter 3D, uh, 3D reality, it emerges bilaterally into the opposing the, of polarity, right? So evil, in its sense, is actually also an expression of the divine, very much removed from the divine in this egoic narcissistic consciousness, but it can never be separated. And you see this beautifully shown in the yin and yang sign, right? The black and the white, with the black dot still in the white, and the white dot in the black. So everything has this interplay. So we cannot, it, the awakening process and the way to fight the matrix is actually, quote unquote, necessarily fighting them, but transcending them, right? Now, <clears throat> Michael Topper notes here in his excellent article, The Positive Negative Ra uh, Realms of Higher Densities, it's on my website, you guys can check it out. Without duality, there would be no existence to discuss. From the one, there's bilateral emergence. Negative consciousness arises from the self-viewing self at the instant of creation and is, therefore, an integral part of creation. It cannot be separated from it because it exists only because of positive creative inception. Neither can exist without the other. It's that simple. Thus, we see the efforts to save the world via punishment of the wicked or conversion to the light or spiritualizing matter with love are all expressions of fundamental desire to undo creation to kill God through the idea that evil and darkness is a rebellion, a fault, a thing to be done away with. The twist is introduced that lays the groundwork for domination and absorption. And that's really the modus operandi of the hyperdimensional matrix, which is also called divide and conquer. There's nothing wrong with reality. Everything, what is here, has, needs to be here and has its right to exist. Evil has its free will to exist. In fact, evil plays a big part in the evolution of consciousness to, from a higher perspective, to create that friction, to ignite that alchemical fire within, right? It's all part of duality. When we try to get rid of it, we, we, do, we don't play the game. We actually then feed into the matrix agenda of the hyperdimensional matrix. And it will, we're just going in circles. We're caught in a time loop. So again, it's about transcending the matrix. And that, again, entails this deep esoteric work there. So we come more in alignment in our unique soul evolution and soul purpose. And then we are doing what we're truly supposed to do, which is most often not what we thought we were going to do, right? Then all these ambitions and goals and desires fade away. And as Adil Shanti see this, this me kind of like 
van goes away and you f sense yourself more as a transducer of this higher energy and that has way more profound effects on external reality and in fact that's a true secret towards reality creation right the law of attraction the film the secret are severely superficial distorted uh, versions of, of of how reality creation works and actually also part of the matrix actually so as I meant, the modus oper uh, mentioned, the modus operandi of the matrix control system is divide and conquer, and taps, ties into the trap of identification. Now, <clears throat> divide and conquer, as I summarize this, is a term used to describe the ancient game of controlling all sides of a debate, issue, or conflict, and pitting human groups involved against one another, not only to manipulate them into acting out in accordance with the specific result in mind, but to create the right emotional loose frequency food to be used as sustenance by hyperdimensional forces, whilst keeping humanity locked within a frequency prison of endlessly repeating trauma cycles. And we look at history, or nowadays, it's always we fight each other, right? And why do we fight each other? Because of identification. People identify themselves with beliefs, ideologies, and all of that. And the b best example is, you know, when, wherever you grow up or born, you identify yourself with that nation or country. And that's already the first trap the matrix has you. If you see yourself as an American, identify yourself with this colored rag called the flag, you know, the matrix has you. You know, you believe in this artificial, you know, abstract concept of borders, which is completely unnatural. The matrix has you. And that simple, it already starts right there, right? So, you know, despite the well-meaning intention, people who still, like, want to be activists but still identify with the country or nation, they still play within the matrix rules. And no true change can happen from there. So it is about, you know, it goes to this <clears throat> deconditioning, deprogramming. Now you see the best example of the divide and conquer frequency, again, the Trump example of people identifying them, themselves with the left, wanting to fight the right, and both sides wants to get rid of the other side. It's never going to happen, or trying to convince the other side. Moreover, the moment you identify yourself with one side, you automatically, on a metaphysical energetic level, create all create the opposite side with all its variations. It's a closed loop and end game, right? That's why any political affiliation with any groups or movements, you know, the matrix has you. You're not free anymore. You're locked with an, with an identity. Now, <clears throat> I see this trap of identification also in the truth movement out there. You know, for example. Um, uh, I was speaking with Benny and Max as well at Anacapulco, 2018. It was, was a great experience. And um, Jeff Bruick, he's one of the organizers, he had me on his Anarchast last year. And uh, <clears throat> I don't know if you've seen his, his, his podcast, but he, every guest he has on, he asks some first questions. When have you become an anarchist? And I replied to them, I'm not an anarchist. I'm also not a statist, though. But, and I maybe follow some principle of anarchy, but I do not identify myself as an anarchist. You know, it's the mind, the, the male aspect of, of consciousness that always tries to label and put people into boxes, right? This identification is a trap, you know, even on, on these higher levels. Uh, <clears throat> because, you know, in the sense, when you say you're an anarchist, then you also you will create the opposite, statist, <laughs> right? So it is really on this metaphysical level, that's how it happens. And the true freedom is to f not identification of any beliefs or ideologies, no matter how well-meaning they are, right? So it, this trap of indication or divide and conquer also ties into when we tell people what they should or shouldn't be doing. We know when we project onto others what is good for us, you know, even maybe well-meaning intentions. I see this, for example, a lot of people identify themselves as vegans, and some can be very self-righteous and militant about it and think that saves the world and everybody should be vegan. But that attitude, that mind state, that strategy is also matrix-based because you're infringing on free will, you're telling what, what, you're telling what another person should be doing. You know, the moment we tell other people what they should be doing in, in with regards to belief system or lifestyles, the matrix has us. There's an <clears throat> article on my website where I talk about this divide and conquer and trap of identification much deeper, you guys can check out as well. But that's really important to understand this divide and conquer um, <clears throat> frequency because that's the modus operandi of these occult forces, these hidden forces that work through us and um, especially the leaders of the, of the brave world. Speaking of forces, you know, <clears throat> in a sense it's not a trap, but 
with regards to occult hostile forces targeting the seeker. Now occult, I'm sure most of people know, occult simply means hidden, right? And I like the word Sri Aurobindo used the word occult hostile forces. You can call it entities, archons, um, the Jing, they have many names throughout the ages. Any true es esoteric teaching that a soul has not corrupted has talked about these forces, these hyperdimensional forces that keeps us enslaved and works through our own minds and works through other people. So, but when you're sincere on your process of awakening, you will be immediately targeted that by these forces, right? And the way it happens is twofold. They invade your own mind, giving you thought injections, you know, disempowering you, making you doubtful, or tempting you. Temptation is a big one, right? The ego temptation comes in, in uh, to engage in low vibe, uh, low vibe activities, or they work through other people, it's distracting you and whatnot. But it's almost a, it's basically an esoteric rule that the, once you start truly to awaken and raise your frequency, you're immediately targeted by these forces for the simple reason they don't want to lose your, your food source, their food source, right? And you guys cannot see this at all. <laughs> it's a picture of Agent Smith from The Matrix. I'm sure you guys have seen it, but it's an excellent example. And this whole movie is, has a lot of deep esoteric truths. You remember when Neo tried to wake or was waking up at the beginning, Agent Smith was set on up upon him, right? And if you notice, Smith was also inserting himself into other programs trying to get to him. And that's kind of how it works in real life. And um, Tom Montag, with whose uh, work I can also highly recommend, Montag.net, M-A-O-N-T-A-L-K.net. We also did a three and a half hour webinar on called Hyperdimensional Interferences and the Keys to Discernment. And he summarizes it here very well. Because hostile hyperdimensional forces have vested interest in the matrix control system, they go to extraordinary lengths to suppress any destabilizing factors that could disrupt the food supply. Anyone who starts uh, the process of waking up and regaining personal f power and freedom is immediately targeted. This targeting aims to put him or her back to sleep, render him powerless, or make him or lose faith in continuing his path. When a personal impulse through towards freedom occurs, an equal and opposite impulse is set into motion, attracting, attracting to the target various negatively synchronistic opportunities to engage in vibe-lowering experiences to offset his impulse towards freedom. These include situations that aim to induce fear, induce fear, distraction, suffering, doubt, depression, indulgence in lower impulses, and self-serving behavior. Other methods of suppression include sabotaging and distracting a targeted individual via people around him who are open to direct manipulation. Anyone who fails to be fully conscious in the present moment can be a puppet for as long as his or her attention is elsewhere. Lapses of attention are enough for a subconsciously implanted impulse to result in reg regrettable words or action. Most people in this world place no priority on awareness or attentiveness and instead live in a semi-conscious dream state that makes them very prone to become pawns of the matrix control system. Some are born with insufficient level of individualized consciousness, which ties into the topic of organic portals and soulless humans, to ever experience a lucid moment. And it is these who form the primary class of matrix agent. The rest of us functioning as agents only part of the time when we fail to watch ourselves. Due to the plethora of spiritually asleep people in the population, the matrix control system has no problem finding chess pieces to maneuver, uh, to maneuver into places around the target. So, you know, I see it in my own awakening process was through the world, more and more people have actually become aware of this topic of occult forces, the hyperdimensional matrix, which is very encouraging to see. But there's still, you know, as long, again, if we just only focus on the 3D aspect, we, we keep going in circles and we're just fighting shadows on the wall. And obviously, for obvious reasons, that knowledge, this deep as a tech knowledge, has been suppressed and eradicated you know, throughout history, for obvious reasons, since they don't want us to become aware of who is really in control. Having said that, again, going back to the trap of victim or blame consciousness, you don't want to blame these entities either, because they actually have their function as well, from a soul evolutionary perspective. As a matter of fact, they can only attack you or target you where you have your blind spots and wounds and, ex and amplify them or through temptation, your ego weaknesses, and all of that. So from an esoteric perspective, you become more aware, you can actually utilize them as teachers. That's literally written, Sri Aurobindo talks about this, how 
they serve that function. You can utilize them teachers because they make more aware where you need to work on yourself to protect yourself and raise your frequency to a higher vibration. Now what I want to finish off is just in general talking about the path or the process towards awakening, since it's a process, right? We are in what I call this time of transition and it's I mean, the times are intense. You can see it in the world, you can see it in your own lives. A lot of shit is coming up. The light and dark is increasing. But the misperception, especially to the new age and pop spirituality, is that the process of awakening is this linear road up, right? To more bliss, love and light and everything. You know, soon we'll be one happy family and have a party and whatnot with the aliens. But it's not going to happen anytime soon. First of all, nobody, not everyone is here to awaken either. Right? There's a big misconception because it ties into this deeper topic of organic portals and soulless humans. But going back to the process of awakening, it is actually not a linear road, but a spiral up and down and around at the same time. Remember the definition of consciousness and to be conscious, to know more to get together, to be more and more aware of all that is, everything. And we need to become aware, you know, within the dark within ourselves. Everything we have suppressed, we're still avoiding. Any fear or help we have, any wounds, needs to come up and be transmuted. We cannot avoid it. The only way out is through. So from an esoteric perspective, it is this descent and ascent at the same time. We can only ascend as high, as low, as low we can go at the same time. It's a twofold process. And all esoteric teaching have talked about that. As Sartre wrote, the higher one rises, the farther one is pulled down. Evolution does not move higher and higher into an ever more heavenly heaven, but deeper and deeper. Each evolutionary cycle closes a little lower, a little nearer to the center, where the supreme high and low in heaven and earth will finally meet. The more light the seeker possesses, the more darkness he or she uncovers. And that's a true path, right? This includes the shamanic descent into the underworld, right? To battle the demons within and without. But also on this path, we never, if you're sincere on this path, we will never be given more than we can handle. And also we'll never be more reveal, revealed than we are ready. And also we're only being so much revealed as much effort we put in, in terms of our sincerity. And how much... And how much we truly want truth and wake up. You know, Ajashanti said a great thing, you know. Especially nowadays with the awakening process, the term of awakening, is that a lot of people claim that they want to awaken up, but what they're actually saying they want to be happy in their dream state, right? And then when I say this, sometimes people say, well, why can't we have both? And that's exactly the problem, right? Because awakening has nothing to do with being happy, you know? It's about, in, just like love, true love is not necessarily an emotional state, it's a state of being and consciousness. Now, <clears throat> What Sartre said is also what Carl Jung said. No tree, it is said, can grow to heaven unless, it, it roots, unless its roots reach down to hell. Or as Sri Aurobindo said, no one can reach heaven who has not passed through hell. And that's the, that's the path we're in. So disillusionment is part of the process. You know, in these coming years, decades, a lot of you will go, it, there will be more suffering. There will be more disillusionment, but it has its place. It's like we're in the rebirth. We're in the Kali Yuga, right? It's the darkness needs to come out. Everything needs to be revealed. It's part of it. It's the alchemical process from lead into gold. Now, lastly, <laughs> um, <clears throat> to finish it up with, I want to just mention four things which I feel are very important on the path for everyone. And I need to remind them um, of myself every day, and that's humility, sincerity, integrity, and patience. Now, humility is actually an act of force. Humility has the dark side or the misconception of humility to diminish yourself, you're not worth it. That's like the shadow side of humility. But humility relates to understanding, again, you don't take yourself your pers so, pers uh, so seriously, you understand you're just playing a role, you don't get identified with the role, you're a transducer for something much higher, you surrender, aspire to the divine, that's where the humility comes in. And humility is also grounded in having that found that center within, you understand that nothing out there can affect you, nobody can take your power away, right? You find the source within, no one can offend you. And also, nobody can, out there can make you happy, right? Or bring you fulfillment, it's within. And that humility we need also in this day and age. And also, you know, especially nowadays with everybody's, um, 
waking up and we see these conferences sprouting out everywhere, right? Like, you know, Max, Benny, me, we have been in a couple together and all of that, and I'm sure you guys visit some. And I love these events, but I have to say sometimes there's a major celebrity ego stroking going on at these events and complete lack of humility, right? And it's like, and from my perspective, because the way I see it, I just see entities feeding a lot of that through that ego competition, right? So humility. Sincerity, as I mentioned, it's not necessary to be sincere with others. Yes, we need to to a degree, obviously, but also how sincere are we with ourselves? Like self-honesty, and that's a tough one. Because we all lie to ourselves in various ways. We all have our subjective blind spot, and from an esoteric perspective, lies to the self are the most dangerous and the hardest to detect. So, but when you are more sincere in your, prog in your process and have cleared out your wounds and your trauma, you, you have established that witness, that observer, that's very important to be able to observe yourself. And then you see how your mind tricks you. You can witness how from the outside the thought injections come from these forces or how easily you lie to yourself and conscience comes more up. And then it will be harder and harder to lie to yourself to justify or fall into victim blame, right? But that, inner, that sincerity is very, very important. In, in terms of a driving force of how much we want to awaken. And then also obviously relates to integrity. But integrity also relates to walk our talk, which is easier said than done. I mean, look at the material I pr um, present here. I'm not enlightened <laughs> or awake by any means. I'm in my own process, right? And it can be sometimes very hard on myself, so we need to be also gentle with ourselves. But we, the way I see integrity is like, even if you fuck up and make mistakes, being able to own it, right? You know, for me, like uh, my work, if I look back, 10 years ago is my writings, there are a lot of nonsense. I was, I was in my new age phase. I'm like, who was this person? And I admit, I, can, I was wrong. Like, can we also admit that we are wrong because new information came in, new uh, experiences, because it's a process. So that's, for me, integrity. It's just about, you know, also true authenticity. And authenticity, I mean, not necessarily your personality, right, of this image or mask we have, but just being honest, authenticity. And last but not least, patience. You know, we all can be impatient. We all want to be healed and woke yesterday. And, you know, and we see the potential, right? And the mind is usually faster than the rest. Like I mentioned before, we grasp certain truths, deeper spiritual truths in the intellect, and it resonates. But the body and the emotional uh, being is still, like, dealing with all of shit from the past we need to work through. So we need to have patience because ultimately... So that again, we're not in control of this. There's something higher happening in terms of the divine anchoring itself in the evolution of consciousness, and it's not up the timetable, it's not up to us, right? Many things need to happen, even in our own personal lives, before something else can manifest, and ultimately, time is an illusion anyway. And that's a mind fuck to begin with for the mind, right? So, humility, sincerity, integrity, and patience. And with that being said, thank you. <laughs>